myself. Give me one sec. All right. There you go. Hey, good morning, guys. Or good afternoon. Hello. Hi. Hi, Allison. How's it going, John? What do you got to eat there? Today. But first, um, as always, we appreciate if you sign in. There's the link, as always. Um, if you guys go ahead and sign in, it really just helps us out and lets our sponsors know that you guys are coming to the meeting. So, thank you. I'll sign it out. All right, well, I hope you guys were able to sign in. Uh, if you aren't that quick, then, well, I guess get better at typing, but. All right, we're going to head. Hello? Hi. Guys. guys. Hey, shut up. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sean. All right, so we're going to go, go ahead and get started with the announcements, and then we're going to get right into the slides. So first, B-Sides Rochester is coming up. Uh, it's free with a resume. Tickets are free. Jack, do you want to come and talk more about it? So shout out to Professor Olson in the back real quick. Uh, he was the one that told me about this. Um, B-Sides Rochester, it's a conference. Uh, it was held here last year. Next year it'll be at the RITN. It is the week after our spring break. So like we come back from spring break, have a week of classes, and then we go to B-Sides Rochester. Go learn about security. Um, let's see, it's free with your resume. So just show up, hand them a resume, and they give you a badge. Oh, in advance, my bad, in advance. And um, it's going to be even cooler this year. They have electronic badges and a badge hacking competition. So for those of you unfamiliar with uh, conferences for security, a lot of times they'll have electronic badges and challenges. So like, they'll give you this little PCB board, and it'll have lights or other sensors and outputs on it. Uh, and there's some kind of a challenge that you have to like hack the board, and it'll reveal clues, and eventually, like you win a prize or something. Uh, one of the cooler badge challenges I saw, um, it had an RFID blaster on it, and someone hacked that to um, disable people's laptops that had RFID enabled on the, or not RFID, infrared enabled on the front. Uh, so sometimes there's just really cool hardware, uh, and they're just fun to play with. Uh, and besides, it's just a good time, hang out with a bunch of other students and uh, industry professionals. So you guys should check it out. Yeah, I want to second what uh, Jack said. It's a great opportunity, and I believe call for papers are in the next uh, week or two. So if you want to give a talk as well, that's an opportunity. So um, I believe you can be, uh, visit the website to learn more information about that. Uh, next up, though, we have Sean Newman talking about ISTS White Team. Sean Newman, we love you. Oh, thanks, Jack. All right, guys, so I've been here talking about ISTS for the blue teams, but blue team registration is now closed. We got five RIT teams and, like, I don't remember how many teams visiting, but a lot. Um, so, but now, if you still want to participate in ISTS and you didn't get to register as a blue team member, white team registration is still open. You can go to that link right there. There's a lot of things you can still help out with day of um, if you want to get a little bit more involved with that. So fill out that link and... Yeah, we'll let you know what we need help with. So, volunteer for white team. <laughs> yeah, it's a as Nick said, it's a great opportunity to learn, and we definitely need all the help we can get. So, if you guys can come out and help and support the competition, that's great, and it kind of gives you an idea of what ISCS is like without actually competing in it or have to, having to suffer through all the abuse that Red Team gives out. So, <laughs> but it's a great opportunity either way, uh, both sides. So, um, definitely would recommend it. 
All right, and last but not least, Jack again with Hackathon. Heck yeah. Hackathon's tonight. Uh, if you didn't get a ticket, I'm sorry. Um, next semester, we'll do it again. Uh, but if you did get a ticket, come on down. Uh, we'll be starting at 5 o'clock in Sec Lab. We have energy drinks, food, uh, and great company. Uh, but yeah, I'll see you guys tonight. Yeah, I'll be there. I'll be there tonight. So if you guys want to stop in, uh, work on some cool projects, definitely show up. Uh, next up is Next Top. Uh, you know, oh yeah, N6. Sorry. Ian, <laughs> Thanks, Russ. Away. All right, hey guys, what's up? I'm back again, and I'm gonna be up every week for the next month probably talking about N6. So last week I mentioned it, but N6 is the networking systems and infrastructure competition. Basically, you start with nothing and you build out an infrastructure with everything from Active Directory to Windows and Linux clients to VPNs and the whole nine yards. It's a lot of fun. It's a great place to learn. There's no pressure of getting hacked by another blue team or a red team. So it's pretty low pressure and it's a lot of fun. Uh, it's March 30th and 31st. The links to sign up are below. Teams are four or five members. And you can also sign up as an individual if you want to. Either way, it's a team registration fee of 50 bucks. And that includes a t-shirt and food during the events during the weekend. And we're really excited to see you guys out there. Oh, we got a question over here. registration cost for individuals? The individuals register with a team. So if a team registers with four people, we will get the team and the individual in contact with each other. And then they can register as one group. So it's 10 bucks per person. Pierce, did you have a oh, question? I was say, what hours on those days? It's all day. Both Saturday and Sunday. There's sleeping. Well, yes, there is sleeping, and we stop the competition at like seven ish. Okay. Well, I think it's six, and then there's an event. It. I'll get a formalized schedule later. Uh, another question over here. What's the registration fee paying? It pays for a T-shirt and food. Okay. Yep. One more. You just register as an individual. Will you automatically be placed on a team? We are going to figure that out as we go. Uh, we have some individual, individuals registered now, and our goal is to get all of the individuals that are signed up into a team that registers with four people, or we're going to build out teams of just individual registrants. Anybody else? Once? Twice? Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Russ. Yeah, I, uh, I said it last week, but I'll say it again. NSIC is a great way to learn a lot of really valuable skills, a lot of really valuable like, industry skills that you can really translate to your co-ops or full-time jobs. So I would highly recommend it. So thank you, Ian. So last but not, I guess, la definitely last but not least, um, our sponsors. So here are our sponsors. are Platinum and Gold, uh, Silver, Bronze, and our educational sponsors. So we just, yeah, I want to take some time to thank all our sponsors and really appreciate them uh, giving us you know, the ability to do what we do and, and come in here each week and uh, really give you guys great uh, resources to learn and uh, get better security. So now, without further ado, we have uh, a great, great uh, presentation for you this week on advanced Linux for education. And uh, while I couldn't get Linus in here to teach about Linux, um, I got like the next best thing. So let's welcome up Jack and Micah. There you go. So yeah, I'm Jack. I'm Micah. Welcome. Uh, hey. <laughs> yeah. So I'll introduce Micah. This is Micah right here, uh, also known as Knife. Uh, as you can see, we've got the the little American flag, the hat, which he's not wearing today. Uh, pepper, because he's spicy like that. Um, we got a little nerd, because he's a nerd, and then knives, obviously, and a lock for security. Plus, you know, hey bud. Uh, and this is Jack. He kind of knows Linux. His favorite yeah. command is tracer T. Oh yeah. So That's what Next Gen Hacker 101 taught me. Every, everyone tells him he looks like a golden retriever, so he's a real good boy too. <laughs> and in the newsletter, he always yells, let's go. So yeah. Let's go. Let's go. Let's get this started. Uh, so we're going to talk to you about advanced Linux. Who's excited? There's just some Woo! whack. That's a whack. Heck right yeah! Woo! Go home. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. 
So the first thing about Linux, and this kind of covered this in like the intro to Linux, but everything's kind of a file. And if it's not a file, it's represented as a file. So like that's just kind of important to keep in mind as we go through everything else about Linux, because that's going to come back to be like really important, and we'll see why in a couple slides. Um, I'm getting yelled at. Yep. Okay, so there's not like a strict policy that everything has to be a file. Like you can get away with making things not files and memory structures, but then the kernel does that and then they just map them as files. It's like, it's really weird. But the benefits of this is all your tools, like all your command line tools can be used to interact with basically everything. So like cat will work on file descriptors, it'll work on sockets, it'll work on basically any single thing you can do because everything's mapped as a file. Same with like echo, redirections, pipes, so it's really versatile, but it does allow you to break things. And for Red Team, it's really useful because you can do a lot of offensive stuff with it. So like an example of this is procfs. Procfs stands for the proc file system. It's a directory that's mapped in slash proc. The only thing is it's not really a directory. Um, it's a kernel space that holds all information about all the processes. It's like memory. And then the kernel just represents it as a directory, so we can like go in there, CD around, ls to look at what's going on. Again, we can use our basic commands to interact with uh, the kernel memory. So, like some of the really important files, and there's a whole bunch of them for every process. But if you go into like proc and then the PID number, you're going to see a couple files here. So, for example, proc PID exe, that is just a symlink to whatever binary is being run as that process. So if you're running like a Python script, it'll symlink to Python. So it's really good to be able to like kind of track down how processes are starting and like what, what's calling them and everything. Um, you have the environment variable. That's just mapped as a text file. So you can just cat that out and just like read the entire environment variable for a, for a process. You have all the file descriptors in slash FD. So that has your standard in, standard out, standard error, and any other file descriptors that they open up. So like. Uh, one of my favorite things to do on Red Team is you can go into people's bash shells and just cat random data into their, their standard out, and it'll display on their prompt because that is actually the file descriptor that that process is reading from. And then command line, that's the arguments that are passed to the process. So that's just, again, it's mapped as a text file, so you can just cat it out and just see like, what command line was called. And this is what tools like PS um, and like LSOF and Netstat and everything are going to be reading to get that information about processes. Manipulating procfs, again, because it is just a directory, we can kind of screw with it a good bit. Um, you can manipulate information that's going to be seen. So for example, if you mount uh, any random directory, I just like to use slash temp, over the proc PID, then a lot of system functions can't get information about the process. So they're like, hey, this process isn't here. right? You can just make it disappear effectively. The other thing is like in C, if you take argv0 and you just overwrite it with something new, when you go to do ps, it'll show as that name instead because ps is reading from the command line and you've just effectively overwritten it. So you could make it look like the kernel, you can make it look like a kernel thread, you can make it look like systemd, you make it look like anything without actually having to name your process. So it's kind of, kind of useful. And some commands will bypass that by going directly into the kernel memory and reading it. But not many do that, so the majority of them do not, I believe. Is that right? I don't know. Everyone I've seen does read these, except for top. So here, for example, is an example of, um, so we can, we're going to call a function, and we're just going to call sleep for 120 seconds. So it has a process ID, and you can see it's running in our process list. So it's just going on in the background, doing this little loop. And we're going to mount over it in proc with whatever the process ID is there for sleep. And then PS is using proc, but you can see it can't find it there. Because when it goes in there to proc 23589, there's nothing there. The job's still running. The process is still running. But it's not showing up in the process list. So, yeah. It will show up in the mount command, exactly. But how many times do you check the mount command to see what processes are running? Good point. <laughs> so yeah, and, and like all this stuff, there is ways to find. It's just like the, it kind of shows the power of procfs. So um, sorry, but why can I not use Max? Can you? I, I did not know how to use Max. I am like useless. Oh heck! Oops. <laughs> <laughs> Is this the right it's slide? Unix, sir. Unix. Uh, 
Um, <laughs> all right, so raw sockets, these are another really cool thing. Um, how many here has heard of a socket, right? Like a regular old socket, you open it up, you bind to a port, you listen. That's not a raw socket. So raw, raw sockets do not use any of the kernel's interfaces for sockets, like for example, the TCP IP stack, right? They just ignore all that. When you open up a raw socket, you're just there, and the kernel says, hey, you get to control everything. So if you want to check like the time to live, you have to manually go through that byte, read it out yourself, and if you want to do it, uh, send a packet, you have to craft all those bytes exactly as you need them, and the kernel's not going to help you at all because you're not using that stack. So the advantage of this is, for developers, you have complete control over what your sockets are doing, right? You can make your thing do whatever you want. Like Scapy uses raw sockets to send stuff. That's how it's able to just change every little detail because it's not going through the kernel. And it's not like following the constraints. You can just make whatever you want. But on the other hand, like it gives you, it's a lot of work to implement a lot of like the TCP IP stack. You don't realize how much work the kernel is doing for you when you just open up a socket and connect and you have to do it all yourself. But because they don't go through the net filter stack, they're really cool because they don't go through your firewall either. So all these traffic or all this traffic can be seen by the raw socket, even if you have a firewall just dropping everything, because they're not going through the firewall stack and the network stack. Um, so you can sniff stuff. You can kind of see what's going on on the box without ever um, like with with a firewall up. So that's kind of cool. You can abuse them because right, you can look at traffic that's coming to the box without without um, having to put down your firewall. So like, it's great, like if you're on red team, you can just kind of run commands through that or watch what's going on. Like uh, T um, TCP dump uses raw sockets on the back end. It uses libpcap, which I then believe uses raw sockets. So um, yeah, so like you can see what's going on. You can like wire shark data, even though your firewall's up, which is kind of interesting. Um, so here is a great piece of malware we have called Watershell. Um, it executes commands through the raw sockets. And did you remove my link? Pierce, you have a question. Yeah, so you said you, we could wire shark data even if the firewall's running. Um, what am I filtering for in order to see that information? You just see it. So um, okay. TCP view will show you all, sorry, TCP dump. TCP dump will show you all of the packets coming in, all the bytes coming in over the network. So let's say. Uh, I use a raw socket, and I use it to just send the letter A. Uh, what it's going to see is just A. There's not going to be an IP header. Well, uh, IP is not implemented. So yeah. Yeah. There's not going to be an IP header or a TCP header. It's just going to be A on the wire, uh, and it'll see that. Uh, so when you like filter in Wireshark, um, you would have to have on your side as the sender some kind of specification to say. Um, I'm going to start everything with this, and then you'd have to use a Wireshark filter that says data that starts with this magic string or something, or you'd have to, like, because you can't just do tcp.port, because there is no TCP right. header, there is no port. It is just the letter A on the wire. Uh, so I, I don't know that Wireshark would even show that, because it's not a valid um, it'll packet. Like, it'll make them all red and be like, this is malformed. Um, but in TCP dump, it'll just A. Uh, so if you're doing something malicious, usually what you'll do is you'll say system in all caps and then like whatever your shell script is, at least that's what I do. Um, and then you just grep for system, all caps, and whatever your, your um, command is, pipe it to bash. So. Um, yeah, raw sockets also, they don't bind. So if you did like a net stat, it's not going to show that it's listening on a port because it's not listening on a port. It's listening on an interface because raw sockets have no concept of ports. Does that make sense? They're just there on everything. So again, going back to this everything is a file that we talked about, this kind of comes back in because we have this tool called LSOF, which conveniently stands for list open files. And if everything is a file, then this tool can pretty much just find anything that's going on on your system. And it's completely amazing and very powerful. So one of the things you can do by it is you can find by process. And that's a really, really fun command, because if you're like, oh, this process might be malicious, and you LSOF with the PID, you'll get what libraries it's opened, what files it's read, what files it's written to, 
Um, you'll get any network connections that is open. You'll just get basically everything that this uh, process is doing and interacting with because everything it's interacting with is a file. So it's really, really powerful for hunting down processes. You can go by protocol as well. You can be like, I just want to look at uh, IPv4 right there. You can be like IPv6. You can do like, I just want to look at regular good old classic files, like a text file. You could be like, I want to look at sockets. I want to look at um, named pipes. You can look at any different type of file. And you can also track networking information. So uh, this command, for example, we're just basically doing a grep, and we're looking for either TCP or socket in the name. And that'll kind of highlight all the networking information that's going on in the box. And again, raw sockets aren't, it feels like we're jumping around because we go from like raw sockets to this and then the file system. But I'll show you why here in a second. If we look at this, um, the raw socket is not going to be bound. So we have this program called Watershell running. It's in the background. It's not listening, right? We have a netcat shell listening, but that's it. We don't have this Watershell thing listening. And then with LSOF, though, we're going to get a lot more information. And if we look for the sockets in LSOF, we'll see here what happens. There you go. So we can see we've detected a type sock raw. But not only that, we've also just detected our netcat shell. We've detected established connections through SSH. We've detected basically everything that's going on on the networking stack through LSOF. So that's like a really powerful command to just find out exactly what processes are doing on the system. Does that make sense? And then right after you do that and you identify a process listening with a raw socket or on a port that you don't recognize, you can do LSOF-P, which is our process. Yeah, you got it. Yeah. Um, which is our process ID checker. And you can look at all of the libraries it's loaded, its current working directory, uh, and you can just dump more information about that specific process. Um, often it'll show you the source, where the actual uh, thing that's being executed sits, and you can just go look at it. So if it's like a Python script, you can just go vim that file, and you'll see exactly what it's doing. Yeah. So this is very like powerful tools for getting like everything that's basically happening as far as what's running on your system. So it's a really good thing to know. It's also great for debugging. If you're going to be like, oh, it can't load libraries. You can see it's like not reading it or whatever. You can really just look for everything that's happening. This. Heck yeah. Let's talk about file permissions. You guys don't seem super excited about file permissions. But let me tell you why you need, heck yeah, there we go. You should be excited about file permissions, because that is how you're going to shut out Red Team. Yeah, woo. Uh, oh, well, that's super generous of you, Zach. I'm glad you're sharing your box with Red Team. I'm sure they love it. Um, so in Linux, we have our standard read, write, execute permissions. And we have a user owner and a group owner. So over here, we can see uh, a little diagram, and that explains the file permissions. So over here, this is the file type. Uh, this is the permissions of the owner, members of the group, and everyone else. Uh, we have read, write, and execute. Those are the three basic file permissions in Linux. Oh, um, however, there's also uh, special bits, like the set UID bit and the sticky bit. Um, set UID or set? Set UID and set G -G -I, GID. Or GID. Yeah. Um, and what these do, uh, let's talk about set UID, because that's the most uh, significant one specifically for red, blue. Um, so here in the purple, we have a little demo. Uh, I made a little program. All it does is it runs system who am I. So when you execute it, it's just going to tell you what user you're running as. So we can look at it, and we see that it's running with um, read, write, execute for the owner, which is Holto. Uh, read, execute for the group, which is Holto. And read, execute for everyone else. So people can read the file, and they can run it. Um, when I execute it, we get Holto, because it's running as me, which makes sense. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to change the owner to root, and we're going to add the set UID bit. And what set UID is, is anyone who executes that binary is going to run, at, run it as the user that owns it. Uh, UID is the user ID, so set UID means that the program runs as the UID. Um, so here, we've changed the owner to root set UID. So now when it executes, it'll run as root. 
And right here, we can see that the file permissions have changed. So instead of execute, there's S, which is the set UID representation. And then down at the bottom, as soon as that goes away, uh, we can see that when it executes, well, hopefully you guys can see that, it executes as root down there. Um, so this is fantastic when you're red teaming. Uh, what you can do is you can drop set UID binaries all over their box so that as they're locking you out and you're kind of running out of persistence mechanisms, you just drop, pop one of those set UID binaries, just run it, spawn a new shell or something, uh, and then you have root again and you can do whatever you need. This is great for shells. This is great for file editors. Uh, what happens if you set UID vim? Does anyone know? Joe Graham, what happens when you set UID vim? You can run arbitrary commands as root because you can run commands directly in vim. Um, yes, uh, theoretically. We didn't get that to work, but you can definitely uh, modify files that root has access to, like SSH keys, sudoers, Etsy password, all of those wonderful files. Uh, yeah, it's a fantastic tool. Uh, if you're a blue teamer, there are some ways you can just do uh, find, and you can search for specific bits in the file permissions. So I would Google that if you're getting ready for any blue teaming competitions like ISTS, IRSEC, NSIC. Um, in addition to uh, bits and bytes in file permissions, we have special file attributes. And this is not as talked about as often. Um, so I didn't know about this until someone told me about it. And I was blown away. Uh, if you have a file, it's not just the file permissions, but we have these little attributes uh, that we can change with chatter and we can open with, hold on, let's see if I can do this on Nix. Sorry, buddy. <laughs> I'm going to borrow your computer for just, wipe away. Wipe away. okay. We're, uh... Okay, never mind. <laughs> Anyways, take my word for it, or just run it on your own computers. LS Adder will show you what attributes you have open. Oh, heck. Oops. Uh, anyways, leaks. The most important <laughs> uh, file attributes are immutable and append only. So, immutable makes it so that the file uh, can't be modified at all. Uh, so here, we can see I'm changing the attribute. I'm adding the immutable flag to a.txt um, as root. Yes, got yeah, pseudo that one. Um, so we can read from the file, but we can't write to it. We can't delete it. We can't move it. We can't really do anything to this file. Uh, so as a blue teamer, uh, if you want to protect your files, fantastic thing to do is chatter your pseudoers file, password file, uh, Stuff like that, stuff that isn't going to change that often. Uh, just remember to remove it when you go to add a user, because otherwise you're not going to have a good time and you're going to break stuff. Um, second is append only. This is great. All of your logs should always be append only, uh, except for a few because it breaks. Like the apt log uh, does not like being append only, uh, which is extremely frustrating because uh, then you don't have. Uh, it's harder to just to trust your apt log. Uh, if you can't protect it. Uh, what append only does, though, is it prevents it from being deleted, uh, overwritten, so you can't just, that's what this single waka is, is trying to overwrite a.txt. The double waka here is append, and the double waka works, but the single waka doesn't. Uh, what you're waka. waka. It's, so, it's a waka because it's like a Pac-Man, and Pac-Man goes waka, 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 waka. <laughs> Uh, this is the official terminology. I'm sure you could Google it, and it would tell you just that. Uh, but yeah, and if you want to see more of them, you can go to this thing, and they'll explain all the different file attributes. All right, namespaces. Heck yeah. So in Linux, there's namespaces. And namespaces are a way to kind of segment things. So how many of you know what Docker and containers are? Cool. Uh, this is not that, but it's like the OG that. So like before there was this, before there was that, there was these. Um, and there's kind of a holy war about all of the things, well, yeah, all things, but um, containers and namespaces, there's a little bit of a holy war that we're not going to talk about. 
Um, but there's a mount namespace so that you can, uh, the benefit of namespace is that you segment and isolate things. So if I have, uh, yeah. So if I have a process namespace, let's say, uh, that means that all the processes in there are gonna have their own enumeration. So it's like creating its own slash proc folder. Um, the first process in the new process namespace is gonna be one, which is init. Um, and this is super cool because you can uh, like do kind of cheroot things where you have like your own little system running there and you can, you can play with that. Um, all the other processes can't see. So yeah. all the other processes, like they'll only see the processes in their little namespace. So you can't see like system processes that are running like, I don't know, anything that you'd want to keep separate or isolated. Yeah, so if I start a namespace, if I start a namespace, uh, the stuff in the child namespace has no knowledge of the parent namespace, which is a great thing for isolation. Um, for networking, we're creating an independent stack here so that you, like, you, you don't see open, pro open ports of the parent, you only see the other open ports in your child. Uh, and then C groups, which are control groups, and they allow for control over resources, um, they allow you to prioritize certain groups over others on CPU usage. Uh, it allows you to account for resource consumption. So like you can say you get one gig of RAM for this group or stuff like that and you can uh, check in on it and say how much memory are you using? Oh, that's more than one gig, let's not do that. Um, and yeah, they're super useful. Uh, it's something I really wanna learn more about while I was writing this, I was learning a lot. So don't ask me too, too many questions because I will have to Google them too. All right, the Linux kernel. All right, I got you if you got questions on this one, kind of. Not too hard though. Uh, <laughs> it's the go-between between, between user space and hardware. So, uh, and hardware is everything. So like your screen, your file system, all of that nonsense is hardware. Uh, in order to interact with that, we need the kernel because I can't, I'm not gonna write a program that does all of the bits and bytes to open a file and extract the data and then put it to your screen. That would be so many bits and bytes. So the kernel does all the bits and bytes for you and you just call system calls and have the kernel do it for you. Um, so over here, we have a wonderful diagram and I love this diagram. Oh, heck, not yet. Um, but it shows all of the programs on the outside which are the user land programs, and then we have the kernel in between, and then hardware. And it really shows how you go from ring three to ring zero being uh, kernel. Uh, in the purple, we have uh, strace example. strace is system call trace, and that'll print out the uh, various system calls that your program makes as it runs. Uh, it's a fantastic debugging tool. If you're in CSEC 201, you should check out strace because it'll make your life way easier when you don't know what's wrong with your program. Um, so here we can see the first thing we do is exec CVE, which is a syscall to execute a program. We're executing cat. Uh, what it does is it opens temp8.txt, it stats the file, does advise, and then it maps some memory. So we're allocating memory here. We're reading from file three, which we opened here, so f open file descriptor three, read from three, hello slash new, and then here we're writing to standard out, which is one, hello slash new, and there's hello. We can see it right there. It gets printed out as we're running strace. Uh, we free our memory, close our files, and we exit. Um, so these are all the system calls that get called. Uh, when I was doing like rootkit stuff, it was awesome, because I could just run strace on whatever program I wanted to mess with, and I was like, cool, there's so many options here. I can mess with open, I can mess with write, I can mess with read, or I could mess with git dense, or what other functions it calls. It's a really cool tool, and it really helps you understand more about what your system's doing. Um, if you wanna do a quick demo, uh, strace ls, check out what it's doing, try and understand. Um, anyways, after that, we have a code implementation of uh, a system call, so, what happens when you make a system call is because you don't have a stack. 
Uh, you can't pass your stack to the kernel, not really. Um, so you have to move everything to registers, which is called, um, sometimes called fast calls, where you are pushing all of your parameters into the registers, and then you're making your function call, and it's just using the registers instead of using the stack. Um, and so that's how you do all your system calls. So what we're doing here is we put in, uh, it might have changed a little bit, but uh, often what will happen is you'll be moving a value into register like RAX, and that'll be the number of the syscall. So let's say we want to do write. Uh, it's like syscall three or something. Uh, you'll move three into RAX, and then you'll move the pointer to the string that you want to use uh, into it as well, into like RBX or something. And then you call write. And it'll take those two uh, registers, and it'll use them in the uh, system call to execute that write. Uh, so here's a little example of that. All this does is, this is the program from earlier where we're doing set UID zero and then calling who am I. Um, so what happens after you make that call, that system call to do write, system, set UID, or uh, system, uh, is it doesn't just go to the system call table. Um, you have to stop at the interrupt handler. So uh, all programs are running in like an internet interrupt driven context for the most part, which means that they will continue to execute until the program issues an interrupt. Um, and then an interrupt is hand, uh, gets passed off to the kernel, to the interrupt descriptor table. Uh, and so when we pass the interrupt for syscall, syscall is one of the types of interrupts that you can pass. Um, in Intel x86, I think it's like OX80 or something is the uh, number that syscall is. Uh, and what that does is it says, okay, uh, interrupt. We're jumping to the interrupt handler. Interrupt handler takes the number of the interrupt, which is going to be syscall, and it says, right, I'm going to make a syscall. And then it goes and it takes the other parameters that you've passed in your registers, and it looks at the system call table, and it says, oh, it's going to be this system call. And then it passes a long execution to the system call table and the system call itself, and it does the writes. Does anyone have any questions so far? Cool beans, dudes. All right, so now uh, SC Linux. I know nothing about this, but I thought it was super cool. And Professor Olson suggested that we talk about it, and I 100% agree because I think it's super interesting. But I learned about this at 2 a.m. last night uh, from Nicholas O'Brien, and so I'm going to try and do an okay job presenting this and then ask Nick if I did all right. So are you guys ready? Heck yeah, let's go. All right, so SE Linux provides more fine-grained control over the system rather than the regular uh, Linux uh, file bits where we got our read, write, execute, you can do way more. You can do like specific things it can execute and like specific things it can execute where or like what it can talk to. So you can say um, this file is allowed to make TCP connections or like this process is allowed to make TCP connections or this process is allowed to open files. Um, so instead of just like executing, you can, you, yeah, you can do way more. You can tell it how to execute. Uh, instead of mandatory, uh, instead of discretionary access controls like in Linux, which is where the owner of the file decides who can use what, who can do what, the system administrator or root, in, off, in most cases, uh, is the one in charge, and it's mandatory access control. And so root has to say, uh, you're allowed to do this, you're allowed to do that, you're allowed to do this, you're allowed to do that. So it's much more verbose. You have to tell it very explicitly what it's allowed to do. Uh, and you can break things super easily. Uh, but SE Linux is mostly made up of uh, user's roles, type or domain, and level. And uh, it uses these to hone in on specific things and enforce specific uh, rules for uh, different uh, objects in the system. And then this is an example of what it looks like when you're running SE Linux. Uh, if you do ls-z, you can see the domain, the object, and the user that it's running in. Uh, so right now it's unconfined, which means that we haven't applied any rules to it. Uh, and then here we can see it's a system, object, Etsy. Uh, 
So that would be an example of one that is confined. Uh, questions? All right, I'm going to ask someone, what are the four parts of SE Linux? Who is paying attention? Oh, you all failed. You all failed. All right. Cool. Hey, what's up? What are the four parts of SE Linux? Oh, heck. <laughs> well, you got your domain, your user, your level, and your role. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> hey, man, I learned it at 2 a.m., and then I stayed up till 4, so there's only so much. Hey, Joe. Uh, you linked to some super cool malware from this advanced persistent threat called RIC Red Team before. Should I just run that directly on my computer? Yeah, if you want. Uh, Joe was asking if you should run the super elite malware from the RIT Red Team that we leaked. Uh, and yeah, heck yeah, dude. Go for it. Run that. Yeah, absolutely. That way I can help you administer your system, Joe. <laughs> All right. Well, if no one else has like legit questions, we'll let you guys get to demo time. Oh, wait. Oh, heck. What's up? All right, never mind. Well, thank you guys. Good luck.